तर आजचा जो आपला कार्यक्रम आहे तो हायपर टेन्शन म्हणजे ब्लड प्रेशर वरती किंवा खाली ब्लड प्रेशर हे आपल्या सगळ्यांच्या ओळखीत आहे त्याच्यामध्ये प्रत्येकाला त्याचा केव्हा ना केव्हा तरी अनुभव आलेला असतो येत असतो किंवा येणार असतो तर त्या संदर्भामध्ये आपल्याला अनेक प्रश्न असतात आणि बऱ्याच वेळा असं होतं ते प्रश्न कुणाला विचारायचे हे कळत नाही तर त्यासाठी पूर्णपणे माहिती देण्यासाठी आपल्यापैकी डॉक्टर वार्देकर आज यांनी एक प्रेझेंटेशन तयार केलं आहे असाच वार्देकरांची ओळख करून द्यात काही वेगळी ओळख करून द्यात काही कारण नाही आहे त्याने आपल्याला मेडिकल क्षेत्रामध्ये अनेक प्रेझेंटेशन आतापर्यंत केलेली आहेत त्यांचं मला एक आश्चर्य म्हणा किंवा कौतुक वाटत की हे जे सगळे प्रोफेशनल असतात ते त्यांचा व्यवसाय नेहमीचा संपला की त्यांच्या ज्ञानावर गंध चढायला लागतो आणि आपण जे काही कामं केली ती पाच दोन चार पाच दहा वर्षामध्ये सगळं विसरून जात असत परंतु वार्धेकरांनी तसं केलेलं नाहीये त्यांच्या ज्या क्षेत्रामध्ये त्यांनी काम केलं त्या क्षेत्रामधली संपूर्ण माहिती त्यांना अद्यावत माहिती त्यांना असते आहे आणि त्याबद्दल कुणीही काही प्रश्न जर विचारला तर त्यामध्ये पूर्णपणे रिसर्च करून तिची माहिती नेहमी लोकांना पुरवत असतात तर जास्ती न बोलता याची त्या संदर्भ म्हणजे याबद्दलची माहिती त्याबद्दलच प्रेझेंटेशन करण्यासाठी डॉक्टर वार्देकरांना मी विनंती करतो सो थँक्यू व्हेरी मच आय एम ए थ्रिलर whenever we don't get any speaker i try to step in and close that gap that is my functionality so today i chose a topic uh, hypertension because it's a very common disease and it is also called as silent killer aaj cha mani mi marathi pan bolu shakto pan mi janun bujun english madhe bolto hai karan english madhe jar mi bollo tar te jasta lokan padant pochel madhe madhe वेळ आली तर मराठीत बोलीन म्हणजे ऍडिशनल बोलीन तर सायलेंट किलर ह्याला म्हणतात आणि त्याच्याबद्दल आपल्याला माहिती असलेली बरी म्हणून कॉमन मी अशा वस्तू त्याच्यात बोलणार आहे की जे ज्याच्याने हाऊ कॅन यू मॅनेज युअर ओन ब्लड प्रेशर अँड दॅट इज द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टंट पार्ट वन्स यू नो हाऊ टू हँडल युअर ब्लड प्रेशर it becomes easy for your doctor to take care of you and properly answer your questions so without any further delay uh, my credentials are there i will start this what we are going to cover today is what is blood pressure and some known facts about it some statistical data about it why we should control your blood pressure and what is the impact or once your blood pressure is brought under control or if you do not take care of your blood pressure properly how do we measure blood pressure the main focus is going to be on how are you going to measure your blood pressure and which is the most reliable method of measuring your blood pressure also it is good to know what is normal and what when do we start calling it hypertension or high blood pressure can we control blood pressure it is nice to talk about it that we should control our blood pressure but can we actually do it and if so how do we control it and for controlling if we have to use any medications then we have to know what those medications what side effect those medications can cause so blood pressure is the pressure exerted on your arterial wall from inside by the circulating blood so the pressure exerted 
on the inner wall of the arteries, as you can see here, this is the inner wall and these arrows show that the blood, the, the blood circulating is exerting a pressure on the wall of the artery. And what is an artery? Artery is a blood vessel which carries blood away from the heart to the periphery, giving nutrition and oxygen and everything else. So that is an artery and blood pressure is the pressure exerted by the column of blood inside a blood vessel. So that is what the blood pressure is defined as. So if you look at the blood pressure, it is the pressure is force divided by unit area. So remember the concept, if you take a small box like what is depicted here and you fill it with fluid, that filled fluid will exert some pressure on the walls of that container. Now, if the container has more fluid, more pressure is exerted on the walls. If the container has less fluid, less pressure is exerted on the wall. So now I'm going to translate this thing uh, into what we call as a, a container and content. Container is your arterial system and your heart and content is your blood and the circulating fluid which constitutes the blood. So if there is a container and there is a certain amount of fluid in it, the circulating blood, normally our, we have about five liters of blood circulating. So that five liter of blood exerts a certain pressure on the wall of the artery. And that is what we measure as called as blood pressure. If we increase the quantity of the blood, how are we going to increase the quantity of blood? By retaining more fluid. And how do we retain more fluid? By retaining more salt or more fluid by the kidney. So if our volume expands, the amount of the blood um, um, volume expands, the pressure will have a tendency to go up. When the volume shrink as shown in the right side, the pressure exerted becomes less. Why do we need the blood pressure? We need the blood pressure because by law of physics, blood flows from the higher pressure area to the lower pressure area, which is depicted here. So when the blood is pumped into the circulation from the heart, generating high pressure, from there, the blood has to reach the periphery. And that is why we need the pressure. And that is why, so it is an essential integral part for our, our, us to get our nutrition because for maintaining this circulation, we require a pressure but it should not be too high, it should not be too low, it should be uh, what we call as adequate. So another example of this, so if the content becomes less, the pressure inside that container falls. So if the blood volume shrinks, your blood pressure will fall. How will your blood volume shrink? Suppose you're bleeding from somewhere. If you are having bleeding from somewhere, one of the things which you notice is the, there is a hypotension or fall in the pressure. So if the content goes down, the pressure goes down. If the content increases, like people who retain a lot of salt or uh, eat a lot of salt, the tendency it, it, uh, that salt cannot be circulating in a crystal form. So for it to circulate, it has to be uh, diluted by fluid and that is why the volume increases. So more blood, more pressure. If the same example can be given of the size of the container. So if, what is the container? Your blood vessels. So if your blood vessels expand, so if there is a process of called as vasodilatation, it means the blood vessels have expanded or di become dilated. What will happen? The content, the relative content will become less because the container has become bigger. And that produces again a drop in pressure. Corollary to that, if the container shrinks, so if there is a vasoconstriction, then the pressure inside that chamber 
is going to increase. So the arterial pressure is going to increase and you are going to have higher blood pressure. And we are going to now next examine when do we start calling it a high blood pressure and when do we start calling it as a normal blood pressure or a low blood pressure. So here is a, a depiction. You know, everyone has, uh, I don't have to say that everyone knows that there is, when the doctor describes you, there, he tells you there's a systolic blood pressure and there is a diastolic blood pressure. What is a systolic blood pressure? When the heart, which is depicted here, pumps its blood into the aorta, there is a sudden influx of the blood from, from the heart pumped into the aorta. Now, aorta expands to some extent. As you can see, it has ballooned up here. It expands to some extent to accommodate this blood, but it does not expand to its full extent. That is the reason a high pressure area is created in the aorta and there is a lower pressure area in the periphery. So the blood starts flowing and the pressure recorded at that time is called as systolic blood pressure. Now, what happens in diastole? That is when the heart has relaxed. You can see it has become completely relaxed. The valve has closed. As you can see, the valve here has completely closed. Now, the blood which was pumped into the aorta and had stretched the aortic valve or aortic wall. Now, the aortic wall, because of its elasticity, comes together. When it comes together, the, capa the capacity uh, that is the container has reduced in size and that creates that diastolic blood pressure and that keeps the blood flowing into the diastole. So the systolic was because of the heart pumping and uh, aorta accommodating that blood but not enough dilating and the diastolic is created by elastic recoil of the aorta producing shrinking and reduced capacity of the container and thus maintaining that diastolic flow. Now, in old age, it's very common that this aorta, our arteries start becoming rigid or stiffened. Once it starts becoming stiffened, now you can understand the mechanism that when the blood is pumped into, into the aorta, the aorta has become stiffened, so it doesn't expand enough to accommodate that blood. So your systolic pressure with your age as your aorta starts getting stiffened, starts getting higher and higher and higher. At the same time, because the aorta has become rigid, it doesn't come back also as much as it should have. So that is the reason the diastolic pressure starts falling and falling and falling. This is a typical finding in an elderly that the systolic blood pressure tends to go higher and the diastolic pressure Comes, it starts getting lower and lower. So that is how our normal physiological blood pressure control happens and producing the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. The Why are we so much worried about the blood pressure? The, there are certain facts which are, which are very self-explanatory. About 1.28 billion adults aged 30 to 79 years worldwide have hypertension, and it has nothing to do with the prosperity. It is two thirds of them are living in the low and middle income countries. So this is a statistical staring data right in front of us. An estimated 46% of adults with hypertension, they are unaware that they have high, high blood pressure. So if you tell me there are few patients who come to me and say that, oh, I know when my blood pressure is up. Uh, I just nod. I usually tell them, no, you usually cannot. The patients who also come me come to tell me that they can tell when their cholesterol is up. So, and or their blood sugar is up. There are patients who have told me that, but that is not a very reliable method. The reliable method of knowing that you have, what is your blood pressure is measuring it. Okay. The third fact is, less than half of these hypertensive, they have been diagnosed and are being treated. So a, a poorly managed condition with a very severe consequences to pay in future. One in five adults with hypertension only has it under control. 
That's it. And one of the global target, which we have, the WHO and everyone has decided, is to reduce the prevalence of hypertension by 33% between year 2010-2030. Sooner they can achieve it, better it will be. Now, why it is important? Look at the risk of uh, the blood pressure. Even when your blood pressure is considered to be normal, you are not immune from having cardiovascular disease. So you can see the cardio cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease is say about 2.5 when your blood pressure is very well controlled or is less than 120 by 80. When it is between 120 to 129, which is not true hypertension by, by any stretch of imagination, by definition, which I'm going to show you, but still it has, your cardiovascular disease has increased three folds. It has almost gone to a, around seven. And if your blood pressure is only 130 to 139 by 85 to 89, your incidence has gone to 12. So from 2.5 to 12, that is the impact of blood pressure. Even a 10, 10 millimeter rise in your pressure causes significant problem with uh, of cardiovascular disease. Just to emphasize that point, on the left side, it shows a 10 millimeter decrease in the blood pressure reduces your risk of death due to ischemic heart disease, that is the coronary artery disease, by about 30%. And there is a 40% reduction of the, as the cause of death from stroke or, or cerebrovascular accident. Similarly, the average percent reduction in the incidence of stroke, on the left-hand side, I showed you the death. In the incidence itself, that you got a stroke, but you survived it, and that is, comes down by 35 to 40%, just by 10 millimeter decrease in blood pressure. The incidence of heart attack goes down by 20 to 25%, and heart failure, with that, that the heart is not pumping well, that goes down by about 50%. So the impact of keeping the blood pressure in, under control is great. This is a rule of half. That is only half of the people who have blood pressure have been diagnosed to have blood pressure. Only half of those diagnosed have been properly treated. And only half of those who were treated are actually under good control. So very dismal statistics and great impact, which I just now showed you, what is the impact of that? So how am I going to manage it? The only way you can manage it is if you are aware of what your blood pressure is. That is, that means by measuring the blood pressure. And who measures, who can measure your blood pressure? Number one is you yourself. Number two, your healthcare workers. That is your nurse or pharmacist or your doctor. So these are the four people who measure your blood pressure and will tell you what is your blood pressure and whether you should act upon it or whether it needs to be treated or not. Before 1700, uh, there was no way to determine. We did not have any measure of uh, measuring blood pressure. The first time it was detected by actually cannulating they put a tube into the, uh, uh, that looks like a dog, but it's, a, it's supposed to be a horse. They put, put a cannula, cannula in the artery and they actually saw in, uh, on, the mano, on the manometer displacement because of the rise of the column uh, 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 measuring the blood pressure. But since then, we have come a long ways and we can actually accurately measure the blood pressure. There are four known methods of recording your blood pressure. Number one is, which is the most common, we once in a while decide to go to our doctor and he takes your blood pressure in the office and that is your extent of monitoring your blood pressure. You go, even when those who are very diligent, like I go to my doctor, to my GP at least once a year and he takes the blood pressure, in, 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 my, in my arm and then 
tells me what it is and as long as it is good after that i go again to see him in one year so that is called as office blood pressure measurements that can be attended that means the doctor listening to you by putting the stethoscope on the arm and he listens to the sounds produced of the blood and on the basis he tells you okay your systolic is this much and your diastolic is this much second way of doing it is by oscillometric or there is an electromagnetic wave recording which is supposed to be the preferred way nowadays it was not available before but now it is available so that is the preferred way to get the blood pressure recording and i was very happy when i went to my endocrinologist last time for checkup he was following this method but many of the family physicians have still not switched to the auscultatory uh, to the oscillometric or electronic unattended blood pressure recording which is called as automated office blood pressure recording in that scenario you are put in a uh, room you after about 5 minutes of rest the pump the blood pressure cuff pumps records your blood pressure and it takes three or four readings and then takes an average and the, that methodology is much more accurate than the doctor listening to it through the auscultatory method the third method of blood pressure recording and you will be surprised by the findings is is a home blood pressure monitoring that means you are monitoring your own blood pressure by buying a blood pressure machine i have given a link at the bottom which tells you that uh, the devices which have been approved by canadian hypertensive society so if you click on that link or copy that link and post it uh, paste it on your url in the url thing you it will show you the list of the approved blood pressure machines by the canadian hypertension society so don't just go and buy any machine at least buy a machine which is known and has been tested by the canadian hypertension society so i have given you at the bottom and the lastly is the ambulatory blood pressure uh, monitoring or recording the auscultatory blood pressure recording which is done by the doctor as in the office is the most inaccurate one sorry i am a doctor i do that but this is the most accurate it records the blood pressure almost 9 by 6 mm higher than any other method methodology of recording so if that is the only way you are getting your blood pressure check that is not the most satisfactory way of getting your blood pressure check the auscultatory blood pressure office blood pressure accepted norms before 2021 see the, these standards are changing and i am going to give you the latest also and i am also i have also given you the figure before 2021 what were the accepted norm the normal blood pressure was considered to be less than 120 and less than 80 systolic and diastolic the 130 by 80 was still considered within normal range it was only considered and that between 130 to 139 was called as pre hypertensive means it was still not considered as hypertension it was only called hypertension once it the systolic went above 140 in the office recording of the doctor and the diastolic went above 90 that is when they said oh you have hypertension hypertension for individual with diabetic the it was slightly reduced and any acceptable blood pressure was 130 over 80 don't worry and don't memorize it because all these slides will be provided to you so you can always refer back to these slides so the, uh, this this was how we looked at it before 2021 Since then, 2021, American College of Cardiology changed the the standards. Why did they change? Because I showed you that even at this blood pressure of 120 to 129, what was the incidence of ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease? Even at 130 to 
the, the, the problem was something like four times the baseline if it was below 120, 80. So they said that 120 by 129, 120 to 129 and less than 80 was considered, even con that was considered elevated. And if it was above 130, so 130 to 139 and 80 to 89 was considered as stage one hypertension. And stage two, anything above 140 by 90 was considered as, or was defined as stage two hypertension. So what has changed between the previous and now? What the change has been, the category of the pre-hypertension has been removed. Now, categorizing patient is having elevated blood pressure. So 120 to 129 is also considered as an elevated blood pressure. And 130 to 139 or and 80 to 89 is already considered as stage one hypertension. Previously, it was 140 by 90 considered as one, stage one hypertension. Now it is considered stage one hypertension at 130 to 139. This level and the present level 140 by 90 is classified as stage two. So that has changed. Why it has changed? Because they found the impact on the cardiovascular disease and stroke started, was noticed even at these blood pressures. So that's why the optimum would have been to bring it as low, as close to 120 or below 120 by 80. Now coming to home blood pressure recording. How do we do blood home blood pressure recording? That you should know. So I have given you, I have spent some time in explaining how, how one uh, measures blood pressure at home. The measurements are taken one minute apart with person seated. The, beat, the blood pressure is recorded twice daily, ideally in the morning and the evening. The blood pressure recording continues for at least four days if possible for seven days. The first day is discarded and the average of the remaining day is taken. Retrospective analysis of the clinical trial, trial has shown the studies concluded that a week of self-monitored blood pressure was the most accurate method of blood pressure measurement. So whether you go to your doctor or not go to your doctor, if you want to keep a tab on your blood pressure, whether it is remaining in a good control or not, do home blood pressure monitoring. It is not very difficult to do because you're not going to use the auscultatory method. The, the machines nowadays directly record it. Once you wrap it up, they, they record it. And I have also given you the site from where you can get a reliable machine. During blood, home blood pressure recording, what not to do? Try Take your blood pressure when you are in a hurry. Smoke 30 minutes before measuring your blood pressure. Drink caffeine 30 minutes before measuring your blood pressure. Have a big meal for two hours prior to your taking your blood pressure. Wearing very tight clothes or sitting with cross legs. Talk or watch TV during measuring of the blood pressure. And measuring blood pressure when you are nervous, uncomfortable, or in some sort of pain due to whatever reasons may be. It will, these will cause error in the blood pressure and usually pain and everything else raises, tends to raise the blood pressure. What to do while recording blood pressure? Patient should be seated comfortably with back supported, leg uncrossed, and upper arm bare. Patient's arm should be supported at heart level. table mm -hmm. The table, or a, the, the table, that table should be, this should be raised to the heart level and tell us, the hand should be supported. So that is very important. The patient's arm should be supported at heart level. The cuff of the bladder, whatever you are putting it around, the cuff of the bladder should encircle at least 80% or more of the patient's arm circumference. So he has such a circumference as well. At least 80% of that should be covered with that cuff. The mercury column, when it is when you push it up and when you are deflating it, either mercury or aneroid, the deflation should be done 
two to three millimeter per second, not very rapid um, uh, reduction of the pressure. The first and last audible sound should be recorded as systolic and diastolic. Measurement should be given to the nearest two millimeters. Neither patient nor observer who is taking the blood pressure should be talking during the procedure. What you should not do is an unsupported, what is the result if you don't do this? An unsupported back increases your diastolic pressure. Crossing your leg may increase your systolic pressure. If the upper arm is below the right atrium, the reading will be too high. If the upper arm is above the heart level, the, the, the recorded blood pressure will be too low. If the arm is unsupported and held up by the patient, pressure will be again recorded as higher. If it is an undersized cuff, again, there will be error in the measurement. So it should cover at least 80% of the circumference of your arm. The deflation rate should be not be more than two millimeter at a time. And talking during the procedure may cause measurements to be garbar. So here is the recommended cuff size. Again, don't memorize it. I'm not going to go over it. I've given it to you. So if you are a little endowed person and have got a bigger arms, then you have to change your cuff size accordingly. So I've given you the data so that what cuff size when you are buying that machine, along with that, what cuff size you should be looking for, it is given here. And this is for same thing for the children. Now coming to ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. So wonderful was that doing blood pressure recording at home is supposed to be a very accurate method if you do it properly and gives you an excellent idea of what your blood pressure is doing, whether it needs to be further tweaked, whether you need to get treated or whether you're, you're being over treated. And this is what uh, uh, we get from doing simple home self recording of your blood pressure. Then comes the ambulatory 24 hour blood pressure recording. A lot of people don't like it. Number one, that it is cumbersome because it keeps you awake in the, it takes the blood pressure in the day as well as in the night. And every half an hour or so, it is inflating and deflating and taking your blood pressure automatically. Why, when it should be done, when there is a suspicion of white coat hypertension, and that happens in 10 to 30% of patients that there is a white coat hypertension. What is a white coat hypertension? The blood pressure recorded by your doctor in the doctor's office is higher. And when you take it yourself in the home monitoring, the blood pressure is found to be low. Or you walk into a, uh, into a pharmacy and you put your hand into their, their, their blood pressure machine and you find that that blood pressure has been always normal. But whenever I go to my doctor's office, the blood pressure is always high. That is definition of white coat hypertension. Mask hypertension, that is even worse. Your blood pressure recording in the doctor's office comes out to be normal, while actually your blood pressure is not normal. It is, it is high when you do the blood ambulatory monitoring or you do the home blood pressure monitoring, you find that consistently it is elevated. Resistant hypertension means you, your doctor started you in some treatment, but did I respond to it or not? So if you want to check how is, to monitor, am I, 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 I coming under good control or not, it's not a bad idea to at least somewhere in the time frame to get one ambulatory blood pressure recording because that will tell you very accurately is your blood pressure properly controlled or not. If there is a feeling that the patient's blood pressure is not coming under control. So you come back to the doctor and again, if he finds it is high, again, you come back after seven days and it's again high. So he's, he suspects that you have resistant hypertension. So he will jack up your medication. Before doing that, if you're suspecting resistant hypertension, it's a good idea to get an ambulatory blood pressure recording that will tell him whether it is a true bill or it is not a true bill. Then there is a condition called as episodic hypertension monitoring the effect of therapy and monitoring the side effects. If you're starting to feel dizzy when he has started you on any blood pressure pill, has it overcorrected it? Again, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring helps you to determine that. What is the normal for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? 
it takes the mean of all the readings which it has taken and that should be less than 125 by 75. Secondly, the daytime blood pressure, so any daytime blood pressure should be, should not exceed 130 by 80. And the nighttime blood pressure should be not more than 110 by 65. So there should be at least 10, 10% to 20% drop from your daytime blood pressure and difference between daytime blood pressure and nighttime blood pressure. So these are very, uh, this your doctor should know about this. You don't have to worry about this. The only uh, figures which you have to remember is when you are doing your self home monitoring and I have given you the figures for that, those two. I have given you these figures uh, on uh, of the three recordings. I'm not going to go over it. Office-based recording that is in the doctor's office, 24-hour ambulatory recording, and self-recorded that is home monitoring. And you can go over this table at your leisure and see. Now there are what kind of hypertension there are. There are many kinds of hypertension. One is called as essential hypertension. I hate that term essential. There is nothing essential. Yes, blood pressure is required, but there is nothing uh, essential about having a high blood pressure. That is not essential. Most of the, when we don't know what is the cause of it, we call it as essential or idiopathic hypertension. So in 95% of people, when they develop high blood pressure, we don't know why he has high blood pressure. That is the normal statistics. When 95%, we don't know why he has high blood pressure. Either his vascular system is reacting too aggressively to the same stimuli or his, uh, the salt content of his artery is high. So there are many, many, many theories. I'm not going to go over those theories. We basically don't know. And when they, we don't know, theories come in. And uh, more of the theories, it means less we know about that particular problem. Second is a secondary hypertension. Only 5% of patients have identified cause for hypertension. For example, if your kidneys go astray, you can develop hypertension. If there is narrowing of the aorta, that is called as coaptation of aorta, you can develop hypertension. If there is excessive secretion of certain hormones from your adrenals, that can cause hypertension. So these causes, hormonal or renal based or, the, or narrowing of the artery to the kidney, or narrowing of the aorta, all these causes only constitute 5%. And the remedy for them, them is, you know the, where is the problem, so you can attack that problem. And 95% of people, we have blood pressure rise, which, which happens at certain age, usually around 40-ish age, but can ha happen at any age. And 95%, we don't know the cause of it. Ambulatory blood pressure recording, uh, that is 15 to 30 percent patient show this, which is called as white coat hypertension. I already told you the definition uh, that is on ambulatory blood pressure recording. If there's 15 to 30 percent show this, and office systolic and diastolic pressure reading of greater than 140 by 90, and a 24 hour blood pressure recording less than 130 by 80, that means you have got probably white coat hypertension. Mask hypertension, when office BP is lower than the home BP, and I gave you the figures for that, the figures are here. Paroxysm, it means one day you take the blood pressure, it is completely normal, and the next day you blood, take your blood pressure is 170. That is, it means it is coming in waves, it's coming in episodes, and there are certain conditions which cause it. Your normal essential hypertension, you do not get episodic hypertension. You, you have high blood pressure, and it is usually sustained. It may fluctuate a little up or a little down, but it usually is consistent and is present all the time. Then there's a resistant hypertension, which we talked about. The secondary causes of hypertension, I already told you, renal disease, genetic factors, drug and alcohol, oversynthesis of hormone, arterial disease, that is aorta or renal, and 95% called as essential, that is, unknown cause or cause not known. So question comes, okay, I got hypertension. 
Why should I treat that? What it is going to do to me? The risk associated with hypertension is a continuous risk. So every two millimeter rise in blood pressure, then what, where it should be, causes a 7% increase in cardiovascular mortality and a 10% increase mortality means death from stroke. So pretty, pretty bad. Why does it cause all these things? Okay, here is the uh, uh, picture which shows you that the blood is flowing through your artery and if the pressure exerted by this column of blood is high, that means you have high blood pressure, it causes damage to the inner wall of the artery or endothelium. When it becomes damaged, if you had heard my talk about ischemic heart disease, that damage causes, causes endothelial damage and causes permeation of lipid into the wall of the artery, thus overall causing increased atherosclerosis and narrowing of the blood vessel. And whichever blood vessel is affected, whichever blood vessel becomes narrowed, that organ suffers a damage and produces problem. So if the artery to the heart is narrowed because of the consistent high blood pressure, you will develop angina, heart pain, or heart attack. If the artery to the brain is narrowed, you will get stroke. If the artery to the eye is narrowed, you will get blindness and uh, retinal hemorrhage and things like that. If it is da uh, if the artery to the kidney is damaged, then uh, or is narrowed, you develop problem with the kidneys. So or whichever artery, so it can be multi-system involvement with a single disease, that is your blood pressure is not properly controlled. So this is a mnemonics. Uh, you can lower your blood pressure with word pressure. So get regular what? Physical activity. That is P. That is pressure, P of pressure. Reduce your weight. That is R. Eat a healthy diet. Then stop smoking. Reduce your sodium. Sodium, eat less. You can control your blood pressure by taking, if this is not working, by taking medication and avoid excess of alcohol. So that is the, 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 the thing, pressure. Now, for control of your, for the reason why you had blood pressure, there are certain factors you cannot change. It means you cannot change your ethnicity that you are a Indian born or Maharashtrian that's going to remain like that. You cannot change your age, you cannot change your sex, you cannot change your family history, but there are certain things which can be changed, which will affect the control of your blood pressure. And those are diet, smoking, lack of exercise, alcohol intake, stress, sleep apnea, diabetes, managing it properly, kidney disease, managing it properly, and properly taking medication and avoiding certain medication if you have high, high blood pressure, like I told you, NSAID, that is ordinary brufen, ibuprofen. Now I'm going to go a little in the depth of this. Treatment of hypertension is then lifestyle modification in which physical exercise, reduction of sodium, DASH diet, and reduction of alcohol intake and taking your medication properly as prescribed. Lifestyle modification. So if you are obese, the normal, your weight, uh, your weight should be between 18.4 to 24.9 that is your body mass index should be. If it is more than that, it contributes to your hypertension. So try to reduce your body weight down within the normal range. Second clue for to you is measurement of your waist. And your waistline for men should be uh, 88 centimeter, um, uh, should be 102 centimeter or 40 inches for men and less than 88 centimeter or 34.6 inches for women. You should keep that, if this is in, not in that range, it needs to be corrected and you have to incur certain weight loss. Exercise, we, we, all those things which we talked about, I'm going to elaborating a little bit more. Hypertension individuals should exercise at least 30 to six minutes of moderate exercise four to seven times a day, a week. 
like walking, cycling, jogging, or swimming. For us at our age, walking is one of the most non-traumatic type of exercise you can undertake. High intensity exercises are not more effective. intense exercise So high intensity exercises are not more effective in reducing or keeping your blood pressure under control. Weight training exercises can be performed if you have if your blood pressure has brought under control up to the stage one or you, to start with it was at stage one if you have got a very high blood pressure then we say that weight training exercises should be deferred till you have brought your blood pressure under control to these levels and have given you those levels second thing which we want to do is the uh, this just shows you the impact of weight loss and impact of reduction of sodium and impact of high potassium diet so I'm not going to dwell on this. So potential benefit of reduction of sodium in diet, just from 3,500 milligram to 1,700 milligram. What is the impact? One million fewer hypertensive just by doing that. Second, five million fewer visit to the physician's office. Healthcare costs reduced by about 430 to 540 million. 13 percent reduction in cardiovascular death and total health cost saving of 1.3 billion year billion per year so a great impact recommended dietary sodium according to your age is between 19 to 50 this is the table which i have given you uh, basically at our age most of us are, are around 70 plus should be no more than 1200 milligrams and to give you an idea about what is that 2300 milligram of sodium or 100 m mole of sodium is 5.8 gram of salt. That means one level teaspoonful of salt gives you that much. So you are allowed to use half a teaspoonful of salt using the teaspoon in a day to get 1200 milligram of sodium. So that is that gives you some idea what uh, it. Vegetarian diet has been shown to reduce uh, blood pressure. Most of us are vegetarian, so we cannot do much more about it. To reduce blood pressure, uh, if those who like alcohol, enjoy alcohol, they can still do it, but it should be less than two drinks per day. And what is two drinks? Should not exceed more than 14 standard drinks per week for men and nine standard drinks for women. What is a standard drink? I have defined it so that there's no confusion. So you cannot say that this is my standard, a big glass. So one standard drink is 13.62 gram or 17.2 cc of hard liquor or 44 cc of 80 proof or 40% liquor or 355 cc of 5% beer or 148 cc of 12% wine. So I have defined for you to help what is a standard drink and how many you are allowed to take in a day without having the big consequences. DASH diet is high potassium, high grain, high fruit diet. That's why it has more potassium. And I have given you the details of the DASH diet. Uh, this is provided to you. I'm not going to go into the depth of the DASH diet. If you are taking medication, it only works if you take them. Mala prescribe ke lehe manun tenjian kaam hootne. Te ghaila pa jete ni. You have to take them for it to be effective. Many medications take up to four to six weeks to produce optimum level. So he started you on a diuretic and after three days your blood pressure, you measure your blood pressure and you say, Doc, call the doctor. Doc, my blood pressure hasn't come down. Don't do that. Because the diuretics take a little while before their optimal effect is produced. So give it a few weeks before making him a call or going to see him again. Okay, if he still not come down, then go and see him or talk to him. Stopping medications, once your blood pressure has become normal, it will cause it to rise again. It may be to a dangerous level because of rebound. So 
we do not cure blood pressure. We control blood pressure. When we give you medication, it keeps it under control. We have not cured the blood pressure because the hell we don't know what is the cause of your blood pressure. We only know that your blood pressure is high and we have given, we have known certain parameters which makes it more risky at that level. So we have brought it down below that level. So when you are taking medication, you have to take medication for the rest of your life. Because you went on the medication, that, that is not the reason why you have to take it for your life. Your disease is such that you have to take it for life. So you have to continue taking your medication. When you take many, many medication for blood pressure control, it also, many of them also help to prevent heart attacks. That is the added benefit. Most patients require more than one or two medication. So don't get panic. Okay, my doctor prescribed. I, last time I went, he gave me one medication and next time I went, he added another one. My, my, my hypertension is good, getting totally out of control. That is not the scenario. Majority of patients require two or three medications uh, uh, to control their blood pressure. As you are taking medication, it does not exempt you from the lifestyle changes. So, so, your lifestyle modification does not alter just because you are taking medication. That is an additional step or that is you start with that to, to start with. The few words about side effect of medication. All medications have side effects. If some doctor tells you, I'm giving you a medication which doesn't have a side effect, run away. Because there is no medication made on the earth which does not have side effects. You may not get it, but it has side effects. You have to report your side effect to your treating doctor so that he can modify your treatment, modify the doses. If you don't tell him you are having a problem, he doesn't know. He assumes that everything is hunky-dory and you are not having any problem with the medication. You are tolerating it very well. So you have to tell, report it to him. Unless you report, he is not aware that you are having problems. There is no standard regimen it is prescribed according to presence or absence of other associated diseases which he notices, like even to give an example, ethnicity, like back population, calcium channel blocker is my first go-to drug or diuretic. While in others, that might be something else. For a diabetic, I may use an ACE inhibitor. For a patient with coronary artery disease, I may use a beta blocker. So, don't go by that you may require additional and majority of people do require additional. We start at the minimum and then we build it up. Some examples of side effects, feeling dizzy when you are changing posture could be a sign of postural drop in your blood pressure. It means certain medication which has been used is causing a shrinkage of the volume and that produces postural hypotension. So if you are feeling dizzy after starting to take medication, report it. He doesn't know that you are having this problem. Feeling weak could be due to too low a BP or your electrolyte has gone haywire. The, the diuretic which you have been put on to control your blood pressure might have made your sodium go haywire. Headaches with vasodilator, cough with ACE inhibitor, impotency and nightmare with beta blocker, and also feeling of fatigue, shortness of breath with beta blocker in asthmatic, masking hypoglycemia, we skip this slide, Prognosis of mask and white coat hypertension. I have given you the data. I'm not going to go over it. Pharmacological therapy is not indicated. So we don't like to give you medication to treat your blood pressure if your blood pressure is less than 135 by 85. It does not mean that you do not need treatment. It only means that other lifestyle modification should be implemented. You may not need a pill because that stage has not come. Once the blood pressure has been confirmed to be in a higher range and is not controlled by the lifestyle modification in a month to two, then I will add the blood pressure medication. And with that, I have not told you anything about medi medicine or medications because you will unnecessarily so your uh, knowledge and impose mala he kani deta mala te kani deta the doctor kare so tasa nahi bhavo but in general i have listed them 
there are various medications which are being used. Diuretic, what they cause? They reduce the content because they reduce the blood volume. Content any container, content any container. Beta blocker causes, reduces the force of contraction of the heart, reduces the heart rate, so reduces the ejection. So that means it reduces again the content as well as the, the it blocks the, uh, the vasoconstriction. So calcium channel blocker, amlodipine and herapimil, they increase the container because they are vasodilators. I have told you again, if the container size increases, the pressure inside drops. ACE inhibitor, ARB, like example like Ramipril, Lisnopril, Valsartan, Losartan, ganglion blockade drugs, alpha channel blocker like alfugosine or doxagosine. So I've just given you a few names and I have mentioned some side effects that if somebody is a, has been started on drug diuretic, he may show electrolyte imbalance, increase in blood sugar, or he may show problem with the postural hypotension. Beta blockers usually cause fatigue, nightmares, impotency, claudication. Calcium channel blocker causes peripheral swelling in the leg or edema or palpitation. ACE inhibitors cause a peculiar type of dry hacking cough. Report it because he doesn't know unless you tell him. Ganglion blocker causes postural hypertension, impotency, and constipation, and alpha channel blocker can cause dizziness. With that, I conclude and I'm open for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vardita. Upon Prashnotar Yuya, and he Prashnotar Jahe, Timina Dadegator, managed Karnaret, Tertas under Baja Jagge Suchina head, Mina de Terra. Mina? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Varzekar. And yet upon Prashna Guya. तो प्लीज इलेक्ट्रॉनिक रिएक्शन बटन वर से हाथ वर्ती करा मंजे तो माला जास्ते चार्ट वर्ती दिस्तो अनि माला स्क्रीन फ्लिप करावे लागत नहीं पर अदरवाइज तो माला ते कलत नसेल तर मक हाथ वर्ती करा मी लक्ष्य ठेवेन अनि अपन प्रश्न विचार गया किति प्रश्न है तिल है माला क्या माहिती नहीं है त परत रांके नहीं परत दूसरे प्रश्न करें जाओगे और एक आम आगो मागे एक खूब प्रश्न विचारों ना कहने तो मग दूसरा ना विचारता है इतना ही और ये संगीत अंतर आता कौन आला प्रश्न विचार है चासेल तो नहीं जरूर है आसान चिंचिकर चिंचिकर वांटे तो आसान प्रश्न चिंसालकर चिंसालकर हाँ आह नमस्कार खूब खूब धन्यवाद ये खूब शान प्रेजेंटेशन थाला सगरना खूब उपयोगी पढ़ेलस एक प्रश्न होता आई होप आई रिमेम्बर व्हाइट कोट हाइपरटेंशन ले पर मैं घरी आले की बकते कि माता ब्लड प्रेशर तो नॉर्मल है। हे जहाँ सिचुएशन है ते, that is the situation called as white coat hypertension। इतने में दे, मतलब बेसिकली क्या होता है कि that environment produces that degree of anxiety which raises your blood pressure। There are certain people who are very prone to it, there are certain people who don't get it, but those who get it, how will you know that it's a white coat hypertension? घरी आले वाले तुमसे ब्लड प्रेशर होम मॉनिटरिंग में नॉर्मल ही आता है और त्याचा दिक्कत है नहीं दास्ता है तो डेट इंडिकेट्स डेट यू हैव वाइट कोट हाफ अटेंशन बट देन विच इज रिलायबल घर से कतें चाहती थी आई जस्ट गेव यू दैट थिंग दैट होम रिकॉर्डिंग इज द मोस्ट रिलायबल मेथड ऑफ डूइंग and then I have given you the normals for that. So either one, either home blood pressure recording and catch a mean blood pressure, daytime blood pressure, and nighttime blood pressure. There should be 10 to 20% drop during the nighttime from the daytime blood pressure. If these things are normal, 
and you are having only high blood pressure when your doctor examines you, that is an indication of white coat hypertension. Usually it is an innocuous condition. So that means you are nervous at his, his place for some odd reason, whatever, whatever the reason may be, that environment induces anxiety that kicks up your blood pressure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susham? Uh, unmute yourself, please. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Vardikar and Seniors Forum. My uh, question is that we have discussed white coat hypertension. Uh, you also indicated there is a variety called missed uh, hypertension, that wow. sometimes your blood pressure can be very normal in doctor's office. How do you explain that? Thank you. Uh, uh, mass hypertension. There are mass, various yeah, uh, mass. Uh, mass hypertension. Mm -hmm. That is more dangerous because your mm -hmm. doctor tells you and assures you that your blood pressure is normal. But actually, mm -hmm. when you do your home blood pressure recording, when you are in your normal environmental condition, it is found to be high. We don't know why this phenomenon happens. I have given you the percentage that that, that yeah. does not happen that often. About five to ten percent people show that mass hypertension. So I always that is the I, the reason why I say that you should, in addition to the the doctor's college recording data, in addition to that you should do home monitoring because that will tell you whether you are having any episodes of mass hypertension. Or are you having any episodes of white coat hypertension? And then you can take appropriate action. Because if you are having mass hypertension, actually you are a hypertension. Because yeah. at home recording, your blood pressure has been found to be consistently elevated. Mm. That yeah. is one indication where you your ambulatory blood pressure recording. Then you can say ki mala dhari nehmi, um, high milk. So you can call your doctor and say, can you arrange for an ambulatory blood pressure recording? This is one of the indications where you can do the ambulatory blood pressure recording and rule it out whether it is a mass hypertension or whether it is a true bilirubin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shashi Zogrekar or Anvita, you have your hand in your hand. Thank you. Lower your hand, Susham. Yeah. Now? Yeah. Mic unmute. Yes. Okay. Um, what is this entity of low sodium level? I keep low on sodium. hearing from people hmm. in India when they're sick, they say that it is because of the low sodium level. Has it anything to do with the antihypertensives? Uh, hyponatremia. Hyponatremia. There are, there are, that is called as low sodium, is called as hyponatremia. It, it, when they were not doing electrolytes that commonly in India, because one being not available in, a, in the beginning, when we were practicing, it was not generally available. Now it is easily available and they do on every, every, every patient. There are at least 25 causes of hyponatremia. And uh, uh, that it is a true bill that when your sodium goes below a certain level, that could be one of the effects if he, they have put you for your hypertension, they have put you on a diuretic, like thiazide diuretic or furosemide. That itself gradually will start lowering your sodium level and it can come to the level of hyponatremia and that will start producing. One of the initial features will be postural hypotension. That it means uh, you will feel dizzy when you get up from suddenly from chair. And if, to document it, if we take your blood pressure in the sitting position and we take your blood pressure on immediate after standing or after five minutes of standing, that there is at least more than 10 millimeters of drop. Normally, past the dahan millimeter drop is common, but that is normal. But if it is more than 10 to 15 millimeters of drop in the sitting and in, 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 uh, in standing position, it means that it is dropping and you are having postural hypertension. And one of the, then, if there is somebody who is having postural hypertension, then we look for the electrolytes. And if we see the sodium is low, then we have to find out there is an n number of things we have to do to find out 
uh, why your sodium is low. First, I have to we have to determine. It's a big lecture on hyponatremia itself. I can talk for an hour. So the basically you have to check the serum sodium <coughs> kaya hai. Then you have to see if urinary sodium kaya hai. So you have to check the serum sodium and urinary sodium. If it is a true hyponatremia, then as the urinary sodium goes down, the urinary uh, as the serum sodium goes down, the urinary sodium also decreases. If there is a problem in the kidney that is leaking sodium, that's why you have hyponatremia, then your urinary sodium will remain high in spite of high, uh, uh, low uh, serum sodium. Similarly, we also check the osmolality of the blood and the osmolality of the urine. That's why I said that we I can go talk about hyponatremia. It's a true entity. It happens. We have India, they have started detecting it more because they are doing it more, more the electrolytes. And then incidentally, they find they have put somebody. One of the common causes I find that once the patient is hospitalized, many times they hang up 5% dextrose in water instead of dextrose in saline or dextrose. Mm -hmm. And that produces dilutional hyponatremia. That's an effect of this sodium coming this way because to me, cook piney tana dilela. Nustach 5% dextrose in water below. And this is this is very common in post-surgical patients. And look at 5% dextrose down to the other. So they don't give balanced solution to keep the electrolyte in balance. So that is what that hyponatremia they're talking about. It is a true bill. It can be dangerous. It usually does not produce a severe problem unless it comes below 110. Usually 120 per in the hour you should start start correcting it and the correction should be done not rapidly but slowly over hours not not immediately within next two hours you gave a saline injection and you corrected it that will cause cerebral edema so there, there is a protocol <coughs> to do the hyponatremia correction okay thank you thank you um ravi Can you hear me? Lower hand, lower thicker. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got actually two questions, but I'll start with first question first, and then later on we'll see. Uh, question number one: I think you described that how the blood pressure should be measured, and you know, by sitting down quietly and in a certain positions and all those things. But throughout the day, typically a person is always active. Yes. Very rarely he or she is sitting down during the day, apart from night time. Mm. And obviously the blood pressure will be higher during that activity time. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it is supposed really, to be aren't we aren't we exposing ourselves to high blood pressure throughout the day? Anyway, the more active you are, the more susceptible to higher blood pressure. So where is the low blood pressure that you talk about comes into it then? Okay. When you are taking your blood pressure, monitoring your blood pressure, all these data are given under resting condition. And that is the reason Correct. we told you that you should take your blood pressure twice at least, once in the morning, once in the evening. The, with activity, your blood pressure goes up. And this was a very, very great argument. Mommy, exercise kasha la karu. Exercise kasha exactly. yeah. blood pressure wadta. And which yeah. is you told me that it is detrimental to you. So why the hell I should exercise? Right. What happens? Your exercise period, the, the fallacy in that argument is your exercise period is half an hour. So right. that during that half an hour, that blood pressure rises. But yeah. the effect is that post-exercise, your blood pressure comes down much more. And that remains down for a length of time, because when you are not exercising, when you are resting, when you are sitting, when you are watching TV, when you are um, relaxed, sleeping, all this time your blood pressure, overall mean blood pressure drops if you have exercise for that half an hour. So during that half an hour, your blood pressure is high. And that is the reason I told you that you should not be measuring your blood pressure half an hour after exercising. It should be at least a gap of half an hour before you take your blood pressure. So that in that rise of rise of half an hour gives you many more hours of better control of blood pressure. 
that is the reason why you should exercise is thinking or reading or anything activity uh, raises also blood pressure depending upon if you are reading a stressful novel and you are you become emotional with it temporarily there can be a rise in blood pressure so all these things from day to day our emotions our physical activity our impact of the meal the sagata in manun that that is the reason i have told you ki khalle gorging nantar don't ask the parent blood pressure bagun ata and all all for all that there is a slight kick in kick in the blood pressure but still that kick that alone that is necessary because for circulating your food which you have taken you require a slightly higher pressure to circulate all that nutrients that is the reason so there is a good physiological reason why your blood pressure has gone down gone up but after that once you quieten down then it should come down and that is the blood pressure which is most of the time aastas to bhoktatas na kamit kamit ni so tyavar ida tumcha blood pressure normal asala pahije na karan you are unless you are having a nightmare so if you are having a nightmare you can your blood pressure may kick kick up during the nightmare but majority of time all that interval your blood pressure will come down if you have exercise and i have the data i have given you the data how much percentage of reduction of the blood pressure when monitored on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home monitoring happens when you are doing regular exercise okay thank you well, ravi will come back to your second question yeah, sure. um shriram murgan pushpa मला विचारायचं आहे हे जे नंबर्स आहेत हे फक्त एज रिलेटेड आहेत का म्हणजे फॉर्टी इयर ओल्ड मॅन अँड सेव्हन्टी इयर ओल्ड पर्सन सेम नंबर वन थर्टी आधी एके काळी म्हणायचे की फॉर एव्हरी एव्हरी डिकेड आफ्टर एज फिफ्टी यू कॅन ऍक्सेप्ट टेन मिलीमीटर हायर ब्लड प्रेशर असं म्हणायचे बट आय ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू ऍज युअर इन एज इज इन्क्रीजिंग your systolic blood pressure has a tendency to keep going higher and higher your diastolic blood pressure has a tendency to go lower and lower because of the stiffening of the aorta so if at present we have found out statistically that systolic blood pressure rise is as harmful as the diastolic blood pressure rise so for all people even with the age we do not like to keep the blood pressure me me in my own practice i give a margin of 10 mm not more than that so i try to keep the blood pressure if somebody's blood pressure is above 140 90 i will definitely try to bring it below that i do not try to bring it in a person who has a blood pressure 130 by 80 or 85 i will not push the medication on him the reason for that is he will have problem with postural hypotension much more compared to person who is having 160 and teta blood pressure is halti on to manun uh, uh, this with age the uh, allowing higher blood pressure to be tolerated is not a very good idea we still want to keep the blood pressure within the parameters not exceeding 140 by 90 for sure at any age thank you um sushil gokhle um my question is are, is there any indication for prn um medications like amlodipine prn for example no i told you we don't cure blood pressure we only control it so if you are going off of it your blood pressure is going to be that's a effect there for certain hours also if you are taking amlodipine so the duration of action of amlodipine is defined the duration of action for beta blocker is defined so if you stop it and you take it so what you are saying that if i find my blood pressure high i will take it if i find my blood pressure is normal i will go off of it that's what you are saying isn't it but well, what i said that your blood pressure is normal because you took it the more the, the it means what you are doing you are allowing your blood pressure to come to normal and then you are leaving it and letting it rise again 
and there can be a rebound phenomenon because it was kept under control by use of the, 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 the calcium channel blocker, which you're talking about amlodipine. If it was kept at that level, suddenly you withdraw that medication, there is a rebound. Many people get a rebound phenomenon. And if your previous blood pressure where because you started was only at a 150, with the rebound, there can be overshoot. It can go to 160, 165, which can be more problematic for you. So take once you take blood pressure pill, you should take it because we we don't claim it to cure your blood pressure. We only control your blood pressure. And when you take it, your blood pressure is under control. When you stop it, your blood pressure is going to creep up. Right. So um, after checking for a week, if it uh, is above that um, desired range, then you have to start taking it for the rest of your life. Yeah, because that is why it is normal, because you are taking it. And Tachananta Thambolanta Thoda Thoda Haruho Wadal Jatana. Yeah. We haven't cured it. All we have done is we have made your container small or container large or the content less by giving you a diuretic or be giving you a calcium channel blocker. So we made the container bigger and that's why your blood pressure came under control. You stop that medication, the container will come the back to its original position and your blood pressure will rise again. Right, thank you. Uh, I also got a quick question on levothyroxine. Uh, I take levothyroxine and what I noticed is when I take that levothyroxine pill, my blood pressure goes up. So I may need a consultation with endocrinologist, whether I need adjustment for my levothyroxine. Uh, yes, so. because normally it should not do that. Normally in hypothyroidism, that is your, if your thyroid is low, you have a tendency for your blood pressure to rise. In hyperthyroidism, you usually, and how do we know that you are a hypo or hyperthyroid? Is by looking at your TSH level. That is what tells us. Right. If you are hypothyroid, it means your TSH level goes up. Compensation. Initially, we used to start treating people whose TSH levels had gone up to 6, 7, 8. 8. treat Nowadays, it, at our age, we accept even a TSH level of 10 before starting treatment. Because we say that the uh, what happens if your T4, T3 is in normal range, but your TSH is still not above 10, we usually don't like to start the thyroid replacement. If your TSH has gone above 10 and your T4, T3 is low normal, or then we like to give you replacement for uh, levothyroxine, basically. I mean, it is a replacement. It is actually because the levothyroxine goes down to compensate your pituitary starts producing TSH to stimulate the thyroid gland to produce more hormone, more thyroid hormone. And that is the compensatory phenomenon. I mean, Manun, you have TSH, you have levothyroxine dealer, you have TSH khalti so because no pituitary doesn't have to do that extra work because you're levothyroxine levels will start going up when you start taking the supplement. And that dose needs to be adjusted based on your TSH level and your uh, thyroxine level. So if, if you're finding that this something like this is happening, you should report it and he will check your T4, T3 and also check your TSH and make the necessary adjustment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Vinayak Fartak, yeah. I go by the names that I see up, obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know who exactly is going to ask question. No, uh, Vinayak no. Fartak. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Vardekar, since the lecture is a good guy, no doubt about it. I have a question for you. I have a question for you. What is the role of yoga? What is the role of hyper blood pressure? What is the role of yoga? It helps to reduce your blood pressure, particularly meditation. I see. Karen. There has been a lot of work done on this mm -hmm. in, uh, in control of blood pressure. And there has been some work done with uh, reporting of the uh, recording of the blood pressure uh -huh. pre and post uh, meditation. And blood pressure, that's any control. 
okay. after a certain limit. So that, that comes into the life modification. So reduction mm -hmm. of stress is one of the things. So Maybe. meditation and uh, yogic exercises does help you to reduce your stress level. Your stress level goes down, your blood pressure also goes down. So yes. if these things do not bring it to the level where we do not need to treat it, that is when you turn to medication. So baki saga te karaycha zasta, manje salt kami karne, vazan kami karne, pota cha ghair kami karne, ani meditation karne, yogic exercises karne, regular exercises karne, all these to be done, with doing this for two to three months, if your blood pressure doesn't come to the level where we want it to be, mm. that's when you go to the medication. Not okay. the first line. Unless uh, your blood pressure to start with was 180. Okay. 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 Yeah. Then I, um, probably you will need medication. Start the medication then and there. Also start the lifestyle modification. And then mm. your requirement of the blood pressure pill may start going down as you, you are improving your lifestyle. I mean, music session Magadhala, maybe she called her Hitoni and Turkia, me Gailo and Tetanter. Egdom relieved us so. In a Tavala, Egdom Mala, Shanta water us so. Tiva blood pressure me get learning, but Mala Egdom Baro water us so. Tetashika is a Munda, Sushaka, Yogataka, Tetaka. Yeah, because any stressful situation, if you're facing something, you are going to do, uh, take a class, even mm. today, giving a lecture, which mm. uh, I can probably give it in, uh, with my eyes closed, but mm. still, thoda sa stress has to, na, kya apan bolto hai, tete tumi jemaan shikara, when you are teaching somebody, there is a mm. level of stress, and any stress level causes your sympathetic, I have not gone into, I am going to, I have included the, the slides, more slides which I haven't talked about. The mm -hmm. pathophysiology of the regulation of blood pressure, how it is regulated. And one of the factors, the central nervous system has got a mm -hmm. very dominant role in control of blood pressure. Right. And that's where that all these things come into the play. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the role of cerebral cortex, mm -hmm. hypothalamus, and the vasomotor center. Is, there's a big component of that and that interplay comes into the play when you are talking about these activities, mental activities, boosting mm -hmm. a, a stressful level. So probably before the class, if you take your blood pressure, and after mm -hmm. the class, if you take your blood pressure, you may find mm -hmm. a difference. Okay, I will like to try. I will start. <laughs> okay, you can thank record you. it and see if that is the case. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we will now go back to Ravi's second question, Ravi. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I'm an, okay, doctor, I'm an engineer and you'll have to excuse me my question because everything I tend to look at it from engineering point of view. From what I understand, you have talked about heart, uh, uh, sorry, uh, blood pressure, but shouldn't that be compared or in, uh, should be seen in relation with the pulse rate? Because the way I see it, you have pressure, high pressure, but the less number of blows is better or equal to high pressure, uh, sorry, uh, low pressure, but high number of pulse rate. Is there any relationship between these two? Uh, see, your cardiac output, that is how much blood is pumped every minute, depends upon two things. Right. The stroke volume, that is how much blood is pumped during each beat of the heart and how many times the heart beats. So Correct. if in a normal person, if you assume that the heart beats 70 beats per minute, so it pumps usually about 70 cc of blood. So normally 70 multiplied by 70 comes to 4,900 cc, so approximately 5 liter. That right. is why we say that the cardiac output is around, I mean, the total circulatory volume is about five liters in a minute because 70 cc multiplied by 70 heartbeat. Now, when your pulse rate changes, suppose your heart, heart rate becomes 60. To compensate that, what happens during when your pulse rate goes down, your heart has more time to relax. 
because the diastole also becomes bigger. So it has more time to relax, so more time to fill. So the filling is more. So each beat produces extra amount of. So if it was pumping 70 cc of blood at 70 beats per minute, now it is probably pumping 75 cc or 80 cc of blood to compensate for that reduction. Yes, exactly. But <laughs> that that so, is exactly my point, engineering exactly. point of view. Yeah. But nobody looks at the heart rate no, we when look you at have the high rate. blood pressure. No, we look at the heart rate. If your blood pressure goes um, heart rate directly related to blood pressure, nine years. Heart Kabul. rate is related to cardiac output. And if cardiac output to heart rate, if, if the heart rate becomes 40, you even if the quantity of blood pumped out by the heart is increased, it cannot compensate to no. that extent. So you will start feeling the lack of blood supply when the heart rate comes down below. Usually, such check heart is open to yet effects to mala body work effective because compensatory the amount of blood pump increases to compensate for a slower heart rate. But once it goes below 60, below 50, then the compensation is not correct. And that's when you start feeling the lack of blood supply. But as such, if your if your blood pressure kicks up too much to answer your question directly with relationship to blood the pressure, Usually, your pulse rate will come down a little bit, come to compensate, come down a little bit. Yes, no, I entirely agree with you, and that is what my thinking was yeah. from engineering point of view. Yeah, because obviously, th this there is some kind of relationship with, yes. of course, upper and lower bounds. Yes. You know. Yes. But somehow, whenever my doctor takes the blood pressure or anything. He just looks at the number in general, anybody, and sort of says, oh, too high or too low, as the case may be, you know, and leave it there. But shouldn't that be compared with the sort of pulse rate and say, oh, looks like it is not too bad if I look at it pulse rate? Uh, the pulse rates are direct impact on the heart, no, direct. on the blood pressure. That's a cardiac output. Over here. Achha, blood 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 even if your pulse is 60, that doesn't then mean that how do you how do you measure cardiac output then? How we, how we measure cardiac output? The, we uh, there is a dye. We inject the dye and we see how much is uh, circulated, how much is put out. So we measure how much we have injected and how much it has become diluted. And that dilution happens because of the cardiac output. So there is a methodology by which uh, we calculate. Same thing we can do with using nuclear tag. That gives us an idea about the cardiac output. Or we can actually measure systolic volume bakto, heart ka, and diastolic volume bakto. And that volume change tells me how much blood was ejected because. Uh, expand whatever some this is seven centimeters and now on shrinking it has become two centimeters so all that blood got ex um, expelled out yes. that gives us an idea of how much was expelled because of the measurement of the systole size and diastole size that gives us an idea about the stroke output so what that test is called uh, that is done during either with the um, Dye study or nuclear study or during cardiac catheterization. During cardiac arrest? Cardiac catheterization. Not arrest. Oh. Oh, I see. We, we put a catheter and we actually measure how much blood is in the, the chamber and we measure how much blood was extruded out during the diastole. Okay, so no, I got the idea. This is exactly from my idea was, the, but nobody explained me. Thank you for explaining that because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is how it should be. And that sort of makes sense to me. <clears throat> that is how it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that you confirmed. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much that doctors and engineers agree because accountants and engineers don't. And uh, I was going to suggest that perhaps <laughs> listening to your wife, your blood pressure can go down very quickly, but no, oh, no goes up. That, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, joke apart, since there are no other questions, I have a one qu quick question, Dr. Vazekar, that these home monitors that we have, we have one already uh, for many years now, do we need to change that or we can keep using that indefinitely? And like, is there any such thing as calibration of that machine yes. or should we worry yes. about that? Yeah, usually what I tell them that if you are having a home monitor, first of all, you have to buy a reliable home monitor, <laughs> which I have given the website. And then I usually tell them that when next time you go to your doctor's, doctor's <laughs> office, take it and uh, he will you uh, he will take the blood pressure using your machine and he will take the blood pressure using a signal manometer which has a mercury column which is supposed to be more ac accurate in, instead of the aneroid me methodology so and then he can tell you how much it is off or whether the measurement which was taken in his office and measurement which you are getting are taken in, in his office with your machine, do they come close to each other? And if not, then it, then the machine needs to be recalibrated. And there are there are people who do the recalibration. Oh, I see. Because I do take mine sometimes uh, to check with doctors. And it's pretty close. So I didn't think about it before. Yeah. So thank so you that, very that much. Is, that is how you, you should do it. Because you should take it and get it checked. Or you, when you go to the pharmacy, they have a machine which is calibrated. You can check it, catch or kitty at any hatcher kitty at any part difference at the cell, then you need your machine to be calibrated. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Now I see two more hands uh, raised. Uh, Susham, you have another question? I just have a, one simple, maybe personal question also. Um, I have uh, systolic is high versus my diastolic is within range it, it is um, higher than previous uh, years but uh, it is still within the range as uh, we talked about the range uh, just now in your uh, lecture dr vadekar so what would be your approach that my systolic is high but diastolic remains um, i would say high normal from a medication perspective i know the health style i mean um, healthy uh, health um, practices and all those things, but from medication perspective, what would be your approach? Well, normally, I, as I said, I explained why the systolic starts creeping up with your age because your aorta has started to become more stiff, and stiff. So the systolic starts creeping up more compared to your diastolic, and as a matter of fact, diastolic may even start getting lower and lower. Mm. But the question is, if depends upon if your systolic is 140 and your diastolic has say remained around 80, 85, I will not be that much worried about it. But if your systolic has gone to 170 or 180, then you need something to bring your systolic down. And uh, diastolic doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because okay. diastolic, when we are giving you medication for systolic, diastolic normal Yeah, I tried once um, these antihypertensives. And that caused dizziness then. Yeah. And postural hypertension, So mm -hmm. depending upon that, if you are having dizziness, particularly, you should get your blood pressure recorded in sitting and standing position. <laughs> And and if there is a clear cut postural drop, then the type of medic there are few medications which do not cause that much of postural change. There are certain medications which cause profound postural hypotension. Do medication which are vasodilator in category, they usually cause more postural hypotension. So also diuretics which is an in integral part of the treatment of hypertension. Majority mm -hmm. of times, many times it is the first drug which the doctor uh -huh. go to. That also causes postural hypertension. So if mm -hmm. somebody is complaining of postural hypertension, I look at his medication 
and I try to choose a medication which is not that much associated with reported postural hypertension. And there are many, many. So many. I, have, I have listed few of them, but there are a many. ton of medication. So you have to choose a medication. If that is the particular symptom, you have to report it. And he has to choose a medication which is not that much associated with postural hypertension. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varzekar. And I think there are no more questions. So I hand over controls back to Mr. Mulgu. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, Dr. Varzekar, to me, I think she can only make it easy. तर मैं अपना शशि दोगरे करना तुमसे आभार मानना सर्दी सांगना रहे तो तेरे पर भी माला एक पक्ष बंगित लो में तुम्हीं जवा जवा सांगित लो कि वो डॉक्टर तार रेफरेंस दिला तो वो मत तुम्हीं मतलब कि ही इट कैन बी सी टू ओके शशि Give us a vote. Of, uh, give Dr. Vardekar a vote of thanks on behalf of uh, the seniors forum. Namaskar, Dr. Ashok Sridhar Vardekar. Yanta wa maza pariche khub zuna. Manje zau zau pasas to varshas. Ati parichayat avadne aste yaha mani pramane me Ashok Vardekar sa se abhar kadis manle nahi. Pranas senior club chhano shanga ne. त्यांचे आभार मानण्याची संधी मला मिळालेली आहे हायपर टेन्शन या दीर्घ विषयाची माहिती सोप्या भाषेत आणि ती पण एका तासात करून दिल्याबद्दल मी त्यांचे अभिनंदन व आम्हा सर्वांतर्फे आभार मानतो आणि त्याचप्रमाणे वरचेवर आमच्या ज्ञानात भर टाकत राहावी अशी विनंतीही करतो नमस्कार Thank you very much, and I hope you got something out of it. I tried to keep it very practical so that I could have taught very complicated things about hypertension, but I kept it that it is useful to you how to manage your blood pressure and in which self-monitoring has a big role. And I emphasize the point that it is pretty accurate to do the self-monitoring. It is. मी घरी घेते आहे म्हणून माझा चुकताय असं नाही आहे ऍक्च्युली द डेटा प्रेझेंटेड शोज दॅट सेल्फ मॉनिटरिंग ब्लड प्रेशर इज बेटर दॅन द डॉक्टर्स ऑफिस ब्लड प्रेशर रेकॉर्डिंग अनलेस इट इज डन अनअटेंडेड सेपरेट थ्रू एन इलेक्ट्रॉनिक डिव्हाइस एकच फक्त सांगावं असं वाटतंय की एक दिवस मी डॉक्टर वाडदेकरांच्या घरी गेलेलो असताना त्यांनी मला विचारलं की अरे माझं ब्लड प्रेशर घेतोस का आणि मी घेतलं आणि ते एकशे वीस आणि ऐंशी होत ओके तर आज जी आपल्याला डॉक्टर वार्दिकाने माहिती दिली आहे असं तुम्हाला असं लोकांना वाटेल की ती आपण पुन्हा वाचावी किंवा त्यांनी जे काही सांगितलेलं आहे ते पुन्हा ऐकावं तर मी असं करेन की त्यांनी जी प्रेझेंटेशन जी पॉवर पॉईंट ची जी हे कॉपी केलेली म्हणजे पी डी एफ कॉपी त्यांची आहे ती आणि आजचं जे प्रेझेंटेशन आहे त्याचं रेकॉर्डिंग त्या गुगल ड्राईव्हवर टाकून त्याची लिंक मी सगळ्यांना पाठवेन ओके जर कोणाला आणखी माहिती जर हवी असेल तर यू कॅन डाऊनलोड इट फ्रॉम दॅट थँक्यू त्या बरोबरच मी जे आज फोटो मला टाकता येतील असं वाटलं होतं पण ते टेक्नॉलॉजिकल इग्नोरन्स मुळे ते टाकता आले नाहीत ते फोटो पण मी त्याच्यावर टाकेन त्याची लिंक सगळ्यांची पाठवेन आणि तुम्ही त्या तुम्हाला जे ज्या गोष्टी हव्या असतील त्या तुम्ही डाउनलोड करून घेऊ शकता तर माझ्यातर्फे डॉक्टर वार्दकर यांचे वैयक्तिक आभार बट इज ऑलवेज अ प्लेजर टू डिस्कस थिंग विथ हेम आणि त्यांनी सगळ्यांना आपल्या सगळ्यांना नक्कीच प्रस्तकारक काही ना काहीतरी जास्ती माहिती दिलेली आहे आणि माझी खात्री आहे की त्याचा उपयोग आपण सर्वांना जास्तीत जास्त प्रकारे होऊ शकेल आणि त्यांनी सांगितलेले जे काही उपाय 
लिमिटेशन आहे त्या जर सगळ्यांनी पाळल्या तर आपल्या प्रत्येकाचं आयुष्य आणखी दोन तीन वर्षां तरी नक्की वाढू शकेल तर थँक्स अ लॉट तर फॉर्मल सेशन इज ओव्हर आणि आता तुम्हाला गप्पा मारायच्या असतील तर गप्पा मारण्याकरता द फ्लोर इज ओपन थँक यू व्हेरी मच डॉक्टर वाडेकर नेहमीप्रमाणे खूप चांगलं झालं प्रेझेंटेशन खूपच छान झालं अप्रोच बदलला होता फक्त हॅपी टेन्शन ऍस सच म्हणून औषध बोललो सुद्धा नाही आणि लेटेस्ट माहिती पण होती लेटेस्ट माहिती पण प्रॅक्टिकल आणि डेटा खूप दिलेला आहे म्हणून वार्धेकर म्हणतात की घरी तुम्ही अभ्यास करत राहा म्हणून ती सारखी माहिती पुरवत राहतात अभ्यास करत राहा वजन कमी करा सिगारेट ओढू नका दारू पिऊ नका अरे मग करायचं काय आयुष्यात दारू दारू प्या ना दारू प्याला सांगितली ना त्यांनी आठवड्यात बारा ग्लास दिलेली आहे म्हणजे काय की बऱ्याच लोकांना दोन ड्रिंक पिण्याऐवजी न पिणं बरं वाटतं रे म्हणून म्हटलं बाकी काही नाही दोनच ड्रिंक घ्यायचं आणि मग थांबायचं याला काही अर्थ आहे का ते म्हणतात आणि आय डोंट माइंड लुझिंग टू इयर्स ऑफ माय लाईफ दॅट इज परफेक्टली फाईन